Let's get down to the real business of taking care of the people. We can't have a testimony without a test. And we are being tested whether we have courage enough, conviction enough, people power enough to stand up and do what is right for ourselves and generations yet unborn. Come on. I'm excited today to be joined by the amazing Linda Sarsour, the national co-chair of the Women's March and former director of the Arab American Association in New York City. She is activist extraordinaire and a hot mama to boot. How you doing, Linda? Thanks for I'm joining me. I'm doing fabulous. Me. I'm so honored to be here with you. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you, too. So let's get right to it, the mm -hmm. Women's March the largest one day in one day, the largest march in U.S. history in terms of activist, activism. And it also compelled women and men from all over the world to be engaged. Yes. What was that moment like for you? And did you ever envision that it would be what, three, three million, five million mm -hmm. people from all over the world engaged in that march? I'll be honest with you, Senator uh, Turner, I didn't think it was going to be like that. I was like, you know, so devastated by this election that I just wanted to be a part of something. I saw a Facebook page. I went in there. I read the description. I didn't see Muslims included in the description. And I just commented and I said, hey, great effort. Please include your Muslim sisters and brothers. Next thing you know, I was the co-chair of the National of the Women's March on Washington. Yeah. So I cautioned people from commenting and suggesting things. But to, to show up that day on January 21st in Washington, D.C. at 5 o'clock in the morning and watching people already showing up at five o'clock in the morning and didn't start till 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And seeing millions of people that came out saying, we're gonna stand together, we're gonna stand for Muslim women and undocumented women and black women and people with disabilities and we're gonna stand for reproductive rights and climate justice and racial justice. It was, it was almost like my dream come true of all the progressive movement and all the progressive issues just coming under one tent and watching people across the country. There were over 450 sister marches across this country, including places like Fairbanks, Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> but also around the world and, and feeling like there is unity and solidarity just coming from every corner of this world. And you inspired a poster that's, that's hot in all over, the, all over the world. I see that poster. And it's, it's, very, it's very good to see that kind of activism. But the fact that you had to say, hey, wait a minute, don't forget about your Muslim sisters. You know, it reminds me of what happened during the women's suffrage movement mm -hmm. when primarily African-American women at that time were really left out. And then when they were engaged, they were treated like the other. There has been some criticism or critique, I should mm -hmm. say, about the women's movement and whether or not it fully embraces Muslim women, African-American women, Latinas, our Asian-American, Native American sisters. Can you speak to that a bit? Because a lot of African, particularly African-American bloggers and writers, women commented on not really feeling a part of the women's march. Absolutely. I mean, um, many of the women of color, in particular black women, we, I was on the same side as them originally, and I really believe that their critiques are valid and they're rooted in history. I mean, this is not just because of the Women's March. Um, historically, women of color, and particularly black women, have been left out of the conversation. And one of the things I always say to my women of color sisters and, and the other two co-chairs who are with me, Tamika Mallory, who's African-American, and Carmen Perez, who's Chicana Mexican, is we really took one for the team. And the reason was we were not about to allow a huge march that was going to go international, set an agenda and say this is the women's agenda and it was going to be led by white women. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was what's go what was going to happen. Yes. So I would have rathered and I chose and I decided and so did Tamika and Carmen that we not only come to the table but that we center the communities we come from mm -hmm. on the middle of that table. And when you looked at that stage, black women, we had transgender women, women of color. We had people from Flint, Michigan. We had undocumented women, South Asian undocumented women from Staten Island. We had undocumented Latinas. Like we made sure that the very people who always felt not included in the women's movement were center on that stage. We had an African-American Muslim hip hop artist that mm -hmm. like that stage was on fire with yeah. that, with that um, Alia Sharif from Oakland. And so we, 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 we are working hard and we are, we are working maybe at a slower pace because we feel that in this moment under this type of administration, you need all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. So we need those white sisters to listen and to absorb and to be part of the conversation to really protect the communities that we come from. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that women of color did that? that if you guys were not at the table, the consciousness level would not quite be the same? 
not only is that fair to say, it's facts yeah. um, that we were able to push these conversations. I remember a New York Times reporter came to me and said, you know, look, I'm watching your Facebook, meaning the Facebook of the Women's March. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of tension, it seems, mm-hmm. because we were talking about race and class. And I said, no, 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 that's not tension. It's not by accident. That is by design. Mm-hmm. We are pushing a conversation that has to happen in this country. And we are forcing people to listen to the stories and experiences of women of color. Mm-hmm. So we're not saying that women, uh, white women's experiences are not valid. They are absolutely valid. They, too, sometimes are treated as second-class citizens as women in this country, they too are fighting for their reproductive rights, but they don't have to deal with issues oftentimes of race. Some of them may have to deal with issues of class, so there are poor white women in this country, but we were able to bring elements into a conversation that doesn't ordinarily happen, and I'm very proud of what we were able to present to the rest of the world. How do you, and African American women sometimes feel some type of way, Mm -hmm. being called women of color because they feel as though they're being overshadowed, Mm -hmm. not in a way that dismisses you know, other women, Asian, mm-hmm. you know, Native American, Latina, mm-hmm. you know, Arab American, which we can break that down mm-hmm. further into ethnicity. Mm-hmm. But sometimes they feel as though their voices are being drowned out when, in fact, it was African American, the African American struggle mm-hmm. in this country that really gave voice to every other community of color. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that dynamic? I mean, I'm humbled and honored uh, to be someone who has studied um, the civil rights movement and in particular focusing on the women of the civil rights movement, which have always been overshadowed by the men like Dr. Martin Luther King. And the critiques are valid and true. And as a person who, when when people see me based on the U.S. Census, I'm white. Mm -hmm. I'm a a woman with light skin, um, but I'm also from the Middle East and I'm also part of a marginalized and targeted group in the United States of America. And, And for me, race is a social construct. But absolutely, there is no other communities other than African American communities and Native communities who have really suffered the most in this country, and I recognize that. And I hope that our black sisters don't feel that we are, you know, playing oppression Olympics or saying, you know, some are more targeted than others, because that would be something that I would never be able to claim um, as as a Palestinian American Muslim woman in this country. And I think it's important for our sisters to critique, but come to the table and critique us. Let's have those honest conversations, and for our sisters to come and reach out to the the women of color who were part of the march, some of whom were black and African American and African and Trinidadian, different types of black women who are involved in the Women's March and say to us, here's where the, our concerns are. Here's where we can move forward together. And that's the kind of conversation I want to have. I, 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 all the criti- critiques were valid. They still are valid. Mm-hmm. They will continue to be valid. But I just want to be able to, for someone to say, you know what? I want to call Linda up. I want to write her an email and I want to meet up with her. I want to meet up with Tamika. I want to meet up with Tabitha. I want to meet up with Diara. I want to meet up with the Natasha and I want to have this conversation with them. So let's critique each other, but from a place of love Mm -hmm. and a place of learning, like teach me. If you see me doing something wrong, I want to be taught. I want to be brought in. I want to be called in, not called out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, the, the spirit that I want to work from. Yeah. And I'm proud that you are there to be a bridge and other women of color, even though I have a a strong critique Mm -hmm. of the Women's March, but I do feel much better having you there. But speaking of critique, Mm -hmm. you have been very vocal about the Democratic Party Mm -hmm. and its leadership or lack thereof and the direction that you would like to speaking for your people, not just Arab Americans, not just, you know, I know that your your, your folks are from Palestine, Mm -hmm. but you speak up for the voices that are not really there within the Democratic Party. And you interviewed on Democracy Now! And I want to quote uh, what you said to Amy. And you said, what I want to say, Amy, is that this is a time for soul searching for the Democratic Party. They left young people out in the cold. They called us naive. They called us idealistic. They left Muslims out of the cold. Anytime Hillary Clinton mentioned us, she said we were eyes and ears. We were on the front lines of countering terrorism. She never talked about us in any other way but as a law enforcement tool. That really, that that, that shook me to my core. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to our audience, just go a little deeper into what, because that's a serious critique that you you made about the Democratic Party and the nominee, the Democratic nominee in 2016. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm a Democrat, but I'm a what what we would consider a low-case Democrat. (laughs) Um, I'm not very loyal to any political party. And the Democratic Party left us out um, in the streets and they uh, ignored us and they called us idealistic and they said that we, you know, you know, universal health care or single payer health care or we shouldn't be in debt as college students. Like these things that we were talking about on the Bernie Sanders campaign, um, they just kind of brushed us off. And Hillary Clinton in particular, um, you know, during the election season, 
again, did not engage us in these conversations. You know, she didn't go to a mosque. You know, she didn't yeah. really come to us as residents of this nation, as citizens of this nation, as human beings with dreams and aspirations, people who care about ending gender violence, people who care about education reform. We care about health care. Like, we are just like every other American. But every time we were spoken about, it was about this idea that we were some terror-hating Muslims. Mm -hmm. I ter uh, you know, terror-hating Muslims. We are, you know, you know, we they are our partners in counting terror. What about our partners in, in, in fighting for justice and equality for all people. How about Amen. that? So that was really, for me, I felt really dehumanized during the campaign, and I was really, obviously, pretty devastated after um, our candidate, Bernie Sanders, didn't win because I felt whole in that campaign. Mm. I felt loved. I felt listened to. I felt that that what I said was important, that my community was valued on that campaign trail, and and Bernie and the people around him, including you, Senator Turner, like, I felt important. I And, and I, I think my community wants to peel, feel part of something much larger, and unfortunately, during this the general election, we did not feel part of that conversation. Agreed. And you and I did a lot together here in New York and across the country, and it was certainly one of the highlights of being on the campaign were to meet strong, badass women, if I can say Thank so. You like you on the campaign and really giving voice because a lot of America, you know, Stephen Covey once says, seek first to understand and then to be understood. And I think what your presence does for a lot of Americans, even Americans of color who may not quite get it because they're being fed a whole bunch of garbage about the other, mm -hmm. but you give voice, you are the personification of what it means to think about what our sisters and brothers from other parts of the world and even people who are Americans, mm -hmm. but they're parents or grandparents are more directly from another country, mm -hmm. you give voice to that. You know, my father, and I don't know if I ever shared this with you, my father is Muslim, mm -hmm. and his name is Talab, Talab Alahi. And, you know, I worry about him, even though he's African-American. A lot of people don't really understand what it means to be Muslim, what's the difference between Muslim, Islam, Arab. Mm -hmm. Would you enlighten us about what it means to be Muslim and what is the difference between Muslim, the practicing of the religion, mm -hmm. and Arab Americans who are now facing lots of discrimination at the hands of a president that is exacerbating tensions that were already there with this Muslim ban? Absolutely. I mean, what what's there? I mean, Muslims are people who practice the Islamic faith. Islam is obviously the religion. Interestingly enough, people conflate Arabs with Muslims when, in fact, about 75 percent of Arabs in the United States of America are Christian, believe it or not. And what's interesting also is that what people t talk about Islam as some foreign entity, you know, we are a religion that belongs on the other side of the world. We're some backwards, you know, religion. When people have no idea that in this country, one third of Muslim Americans are African American. They are indigenous. They are ancestors. Their ancestors were enslaved people that came here forced on sh in shackles. Also, Islam actually came to the United States before this land was even called the United States mm -hmm. of America. They were galley slaves who were Muslim that built the first English colony in, 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 in Roanoke Colony, which is now the coast of North Carolina. So for me, what emboldens me and in and, and telling my story as a Muslim American in this country, when people say, go back to your country, mm -hmm. I say, no, you go back to your country Amen. because my people were here way before you ever got here or even knew there was a land yes. that was going to be called the United States of America. So. Muslim Americans are people who believe in the same God that Jews and Christians believe. But I think, you know, just so from, from my perspective, one thing that I push back on is that I don't want to be in a space telling people like, I believe in the same God that you believe in. My, I have children too and I love my family too. This idea that I have to humanize myself yes. and prove my humanity yeah. uh, to people. I just want to be treated like everybody else and Muslims deserve to be treated like everyone else. Like we're not asking for any special rights in this country. We want to practice our religion freely, freely understand that this is the land of religious freedom. We're not yes. asking for additional religious or freedom. Or so they say. Or so they say, yeah. or so the Muslim community can tell you that that's right. not, as we watch anti-Sharia bills across this country. But um, people have to understand the stresses of someone who's African-American Muslim or African Muslim, oh, yeah. right? This idea that you gotta be Muslim yes. and you're black that's right. in these United States of America. Those are the, the people in, in my community who are the ones that are not getting the opportunity to really tell their stories mm -hmm. and are living under double stress than any other part of the Muslim community. I agree. I worry about my father all the time, especially after 9-11, and I know it was 9-11 that really got your activism, in other words, your spidey mm -hmm. senses started to tingle and it really pushed pushed you into the activist world. But when 9-11 hit, I mean, I really worried about my father. He walks into a room and you see this regal chocolate 
you know, mm -hmm. African American man, but before you see him, his name, Talib Balahi. Mm -hmm. So I, I certainly get where you're coming from with that. And I am so glad that you are in that arena, in that space. We need you there. So three things, you know, I really believe that we're being fed a steady diet of the world is coming to an end, you know, because of this one man. Mm -hmm. What would you say to incur, what, what, can you give us three action items, any three of your choosing directed at any audience, mm -hmm. just three action items that you would like to see people carry out or that they can do, or, or three recommendations, but just something to remind people that ultimately the power is in their hands. If I wasn't a hopeful person, if I believed that there, if I didn't believe there was a bright future ahead of us, I wouldn't even be doing this work. I'd be sitting at home crying, probably doing some dead end job somewhere. Um, I'm hopeful because I believe in the power of the people and I believe that we will be powerful and we will win. And what I tell people all the time is that Donald Trump for me is a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. And I know people think I'm crazy. He woke up masses of people that we've been trying to wake up for a long time to issues of racism, of, of discrimination, issues of poverty in this country. I mean, these are all issues that are not new. Mm -hmm. Reproductive rights is mm -hmm. not new. Climate justice is not racial justice. Like these are, th this is stuff that you and others and myself have been doing, some people for decades in this yes. country. So the three things that I would tell people to do is, you know, we always talk about we got to love and protect one another. And under this type of administration, we have no idea what's to come down the pipeline. And I say to people, how will, how will we love and protect one another if we don't know one another? I tell people, do you know who your next door neighbors are? Do you know who works six cubicles down from you? Do you know who lives down the hall? you know, in your apartment building. And I do that. I knock on doors. I, I say, hey, my name is Linda. How are you doing? I want you to know I'm your neighbor if you ever need anything. And then there is going to come a moment where we're going to need each other. That's right. And we got to know each other in order to be able to intervene and protect one another from what's to come. So that's the first thing. Just know your neighbors. Know the people who work with you. Um, and, and, and if you see a woman of color in particular, just say, hey, you all right? You good? Can I get you a cup of coffee? People yeah. need to be seen in this moment. The se second thing I'll say is show up. People say, oh, what does this marching do? What does this rallying do? Why are we out, in here, out here in these streets? And I tell people, under this type of administration, we need public protest. You mm -hmm. need to, your mm -hmm. dissent needs to be public. Mm -hmm. And dissent is the highest form of patriotism. So that. people can't say, oh, my individual body doesn't matter. No, your body is counted amongst those masses of people that are out there. And this administration needs to hear us loud and clear yeah. every day if we have to. Yeah. So show up in spaces around issues that you care about, health care, immigration, racial justice. Um, so, and also don't forget forget about the fights that were already happening and stay in them and join them if you weren't already a part of them. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I'll say is donate to organizations in your communities that are on the front lines. We can't all be full-time activists and I understand That's that right. we have families, but the least we can do is support those in the movement who are doing the work. And oftentimes we are running on limited resources. We are taking time away from our families. We're sacrificing oftentimes our safety and security in our lives for That's some right. people. $20 a month if you can give to a local community-based organization. If you can pick up the phone and call a local organizer and say, hey, you know, you good? You all right? I see you out here. Are you tired? Like, can I do something for you? Can I, you know, Linda, can I pick up your, your kid from school? Yes. Like, can I bring you lunch? Did you eat today? Like, th these moments, we got to build that beloved community that Dr. Martin Luther King talked Amen. about. And you know what? This might be the moment that we are able to do that because we are all agreeing for the first time who the enemy is. The enemy is very clear, maybe clearer than ever. So that's the three things that I would tell people to do. And that is beautiful, Linda, and I agree. And I hope that all of our viewers heard what, sin what Sister Linda had to say, love and protect one another, show up and donate. Now, in terms of the Women's March, you know, there have been lots of women of color, in particular African-American women, who have critiqued this march. I, too, have a critique mm -hmm. for the march. Was really glad to see you and other sisters of color. But oftentimes, our white, my concern about our white sisters is that they believe that they're going to dictate to us and bring us along mm -hmm. instead of coming to us and asking us what is it that we need Absolutely. and invite us to be part of the leadership because mm -hmm. we, we shouldn't be, you know, on the sidelines mm -hmm. to sometimes symbolically they want us to stand on the stage so that it seems like Absolutely. they're being inclusive. And I'm very concerned about that. So what motivated you mm -hmm. to join this movement, although, you know, uh, lots of women of color, particularly African-Americans, have a critique about it? 
Have and, concerns, I should say. And, and I still have my own critiques as someone who is, is part of the movement, right? There are going to be critiques always, and those critiques are extremely valid. And when we went to the Women's March team and I said personally, like, I'm not going to have my hijab face mm. on a poster for anyone to tokenize me. If I'm yes. not a leader in this movement, if I'm not going to be part of the decision-making process, if I'm not going to get a leadership role, I don't want to be a part of this. And I would have been right back out there with my sisters of color critiquing it as well. Mm. I'm a, I was actually the lead fundraiser um, of, of the Women's March on Washington. I had a very powerful role. And one of the things that I dictated was that we will not take corporate money. And they were like, what? How are we going to do this in such a little bit of time and we're not going to take corporate dollars? I was like, not on my watch. We're not yes. taking corporate dollars. I will not stand on a stage with Coca-Cola, Walmart. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we were able to raise all the money that we needed from the people. Those yeah. $27 that we got from Bernie Sanders' yes. campaign, I, was, I learned that on the campaign. That's where the power of the people lands. So I got to teach I, uh, during that march about what it means to do something with principles and values and with integrity. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The single largest protest in U.S. history happened from a place of integrity and dignity. And you know what? Hard, hard conversations, Nina, that still happen today with our white sisters in the movement across this country. And where does the women's march, I mean, where, where are you going from here? Because some people need to protest, but some people need to plan. Because yes. bottom line is that we need to win elections, we being progressive and conscious-minded folks, mm -hmm. not folks that just want a title. Titles are good, but purpose yes. is better. We need conscious-minded folks winning from local level all the way up to the presidency. Where does the women's mm -hmm. march go from here in that particular space? So we didn't know what was going to happen on January 21st. But after we collected email addresses from across this country, after we connected to 450 organizers who organized sister marches across this country, we were not going to allow that infrastructure to break down. We we've, we've, we've found power mm -hmm. in people who are not oftentimes engaged in activism. These are people that never marched a day in their lives, many of them. So the question is, what do we do with them? So we, the Women's March, are now an entity. We have moved into a building infrastructure. Okay. And the focus is going to be on 2018. We want to run progressive women. We want to make sure that the people who believe in our platform that we built during the Women's March, those are the people we want to support. And that doesn't mean a particular party. Yes. It means people that are going to stand up for the best interest of our community. And those women are fired up. They want to do stuff. They want to engage. And they specifically are interested in electoral politics, knowing that that is where the power lies in the local level, on the local level, on the state level. Those are the areas that we're going to be um, focusing on in 2018 or before 2018, let me say. Amen. We're going to start, start really early. Yeah, so people over parties. So a com kind of I'm the partisan atmosphere where if you just have the consciousness you believe in the an, in a progressive platform it doesn't matter what that initial is behind your no. I mean my, our thing is that you know if you're already a Democrat that doesn't mean I'm gonna support you because I might support other Democrats against you or other people that are going to really once and for all, I think this is our moment to be bold. Yes. It doesn't get worse than this, Nina. No. I can't imagine us being in a worse place mm -hmm. than the situation we're in now. So if this is the worst that it's going to get, we're just going to go all out bold. And mm -hmm. I think that there are plenty of people ready. So get in there and do something. Thank you so much, Linda, for being here with us on the Nina Turner Show on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.